Hello and a very warm welcome to all of the amazing and wonderful listeners out there. This is the Nikhil Hogan Show and I'm very thrilled to speak with my guest today, Academy and Emmy Award winning film composer and conductor Bill Conti. He is best known for his film scores including Rocky, The Karate Kid, For Your Eyes Only, Dynasty and The Right Stuff which earned him an Academy Award for Best Original Score. He was music director at the Academy Awards a record 19 times, and it was announced in June 2020 that Conti had donated his original scores to Louisiana State University. Bill, welcome to the Nikhil Hogan Show. It's great to be here, Nick. Everything is well. This is a music education-themed podcast, so I do want to focus on your training and everything that led up to your first hit, which was Gonna Fly Now with the Rocky series. And I was just so amazed that you had such a rich musical childhood. Your grandfather and your father were professional musicians. They were. uh, Music in the house was uh, common. It was not uh, something that was extraordinary. It was something that we did. So from earliest time, I I, uh, practiced uh, and studied music, yeah. Can I ask, your, your grandfather, What in what capacity was he a professional musician? He played trumpet. Was he from Italy, or what generation Italian was your family? He was born in Italy, yes. And uh, my father and mother were both born in this country, so that I'm the second generation, I guess. And did your grandfather also play the piano and sing? I read that he was also teaching solfeggio. Well, that doesn't mean he sang, but he he, he did teach me uh, solfeggio in the very beginning um my father played a piano and and taught piano and he was a graduate of the rhode island school of design which was a uh, just what it says he he was an artist also but uh primarily a musician you mentioned in an interview that he could play classical music he could play jazz music well, he prepared for the concert stage yeah he he prepared uh, the classics, and uh, in his youth, when he was in his, like, 18, 19 years old, he was uh, on the uh, Grace Line tour boats and uh, and gave concerts in the afternoon. Sometimes you can still do that on the Cunard lines. There will be artists who would uh, give a... Um, a recital of sorts in, in the afternoons on, on board ships. And then, of course, he went away to the Second World War, and that, that uh, destroyed all that. So he came back and uh, continued to play and teach. You've mentioned you started playing the piano around five and six. Did you have a teacher, or were your, was your father your teacher? Oh, well, my father was a teacher, yeah. And he was also the organist at the church, so that I had to be... I don't know, between 8 and 10, when I took over one of the masses in terms of not the ones, not the mass, uh, probably the children's mass, where they only played hymns as opposed to uh, doing uh, Mozart masses and and things like that. And were you sight reading? The skills for to to begin uh, learning music uh, traditionally uh, was to read, to know solfeggio first, which is to sing and play the rhythms of the notes before you even approached uh, an instrument. Growing up, you mentioned listening to your grandparents and your father. Italian opera was in the house as well. Was that music that was very much a part of your development, listening to that and and imitating? Well, for sure, yeah. They, as a, as a, uh, uh, as just fun, after dinner, they would take an opera and they would, they would sing through an opera with one of them taking female parts and the other guy taking the male parts and just kind of hack your way through. It was just terrible, of course, but but it was something that uh, the kind of music that they wanted to hear, the dramatic music, and uh, it was p- popular uh, in previous at- previous times, you know, it was, certainly wasn't popular music of the 20th century, but uh, but they enjoyed doing that, so we heard that a lot. How much did you play the piano growing up? Did you practice X number of hours a day? Well, yeah, You in the beginning, you, you, you began with maybe you had to practice an hour a day, 
and that was like the minimum. You couldn't, you could not not practice. Uh, you had to do your hour every day, and that that was like through the schooling. Um, let's say certainly through middle school and high school, you had to do that. Then, then of course, you had to expand. You can't get anywhere uh, practicing an hour a day. I mean, that has that that has little meaning. But 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 you probably weren't ready to uh, uh, devote a whole lot more time to it until you were older. And then you were kind of forced to, even in even in colleges today, colleges of uh, of note, colleges that care about uh, you being a performance major. Let's say that if you're a vocalist, an instrumentalist, a uh, pianist, things of of that nature, you are required to practice a minimum of uh, hours a day. Now, a vocalist might be like two hours uh, because you can't probably practice that instrument. Uh, but I know at Juilliard, I had a friend who couldn't practice longer than four hours a day, and he was asked to leave because they, because they, re- they require more than that. Did you always improvise and compose in your youth? I did. Uh, the idea of... Uh, there's a tradition in 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 organ playing. Uh, now we're we're talking about great traditions. We're not talking about playing for the children's mass and playing hymns. So improvising is something that is a part of what a, a church organist is trained to do. By the way, it's something that. Uh, is is important and besides that my father had that that ability that he he played in nightclubs at night uh and um and he could improvise also in the jazz idiom so along with the classics you you uh, learned how to improvise um and like anything it takes practice so i practiced that too can I ask about your theoretical conception here? Did you did you learn a lot of music, and from the music you gained theoretical ideas, or were you actually taught theory and 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 put music to theory growing up? I am definitely not self-taught in the sense that I learned how to read music, uh, studied music. I have two bachelors, a master's, and a doctorate in music, so. I've studied music all my life. There are people who can make music and not be uh, familiar with the theory of music, but I'm more than familiar with the theory of music, yeah. The organists that you mentioned, a lot of them would have used an older system of theory, like figured bass and, and that sort of thing. Nowadays, there's a lot more use of, for instance, analysis like Roman numerals and functional analysis. I wanted to ask you, Bill, do you use, I mean, there's so many different ways of theorizing music. Is there a particular way that is useful for you? Well, everything that's been done in the past, you know, everything is built on the past. So, of course, you you move from a figured base. I mean, you go through figured base all to the, through Schoenberg functional analysis of music. It's uh, it's only towards understand understanding what someone has done in an analytical way. It is. Uh, the function of music, of course, is anti-intellectual. It has nothing to do with uh, the theory of music. But, but if you knew the forms, and if you were sophisticated enough to to know Mozart and and Beethoven or or a double fugue of Bach, your satisfaction could be deeper than just the aesthetic experience of listening, which is primarily what music is about. It's not about studying music. It's about listening to it. But you can have a deeper appreciation and a deeper ecstatic experience if you know more. It's always better to know more. And are you referring to perhaps counterpoint and harmony? All of that, of course. All of that, yes. If if, uh, um, 
the instructions in, in elementary harmony that probably end up four years of, of harmony and counterpoint would begin with uh, uh, 16th century uh, counterpoint and then 18th century counterpoint. And you can go into counterpoint in, in great detail. And uh, the meaning it has is only for the person studying and making the analysis. Uh, Bach did not have, he didn't study his own. He had studied people before him. But when we study the era of Bach, we study Bach. Now, he did not study Bach. He, he, did, he, he, he created the idiom that we study. And, and, and when Beethoven uh, uh, wrote a fugue, it wasn't necessarily Bach-like with those particular rules, but he did it his way, and then he left a form for us to study. So to, to know as much of that as you can is uh, deeper. You can buy a bottle of Thunderbird wine and then really, really enjoy it. Or someone could teach you the difference of what a fine wine, what to appreciate. But it, but it takes learning. It's not, uh, it's not just, oh, uh, I'm just going to have a Coca-Cola. You go, okay. And, and and you might enjoy that Coca-Cola, but there are deeper pleasures. But you have to study that. You have to study to get those deeper pleasures. When did you start writing music on scores? In high school. And uh, how did that come about? I had a band, and of course, if uh, you had a band, and if you had, meaning it would be like a dance band, right? Uh, a swing band. And if you wanted to try an idea, you you could write it out and hear it because it would be terrible because you were just as bad as everybody else in the band, but you were all excited about making music. And if you wanted to buy it, you could buy arrangements for the band. But if you could write one, it was... Uh, it's the same way some people are interested in, in repairing cars or having a hobby. So music is, can be all-consuming like that. I was astounded to realize that you were a working musician in salons and, and nightclubs for from the age of 14 all the way to 28, and seven nights a week, something like that. And that's an amazing amount of work that you, you put in. And was that when you were playing in the nightclubs, did you have to think more like a popular musician? Did you think of chord symbols rather than... Um, did you have a different set of a thought process when you were on the nightclub stand? Well, yeah, the, 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 the popular music or the jazz music has its own vocabulary. So it's like you learn a language. You learn to speak that language. Well, music is the same. If you wanted to improvise in, in the Baroque era or the classic era or the romantic era, or you wanted it to sound like Puccini, well, he had a certain set of chords that he used in a certain way as as Brahms, uh, when he did songs, he wrote them in a certain way. So if you go to school on them and if you study them, then you know how to do that. So if you hear a pop tune on the on the radio or you hear a jazz guy, and you say, well, how did he do that? So the curious musician will say, let me figure out how he did that. And, and, and imitation is what it's all about. I mean, you, you begin by imitating the people that you like. So you, you, you have to find out how they did that. So even if you're playing in a saloon, you're, um, you're just imitating the way that's done. So you have to practice, and you don't sound as good as the people that you're listening to because of the obvious reasons. You're beginning, you're the student of the game, but you, if, if you practice, you simply get better. You, you can't not get better if you don't practice. Did you have like a binder with songs, or was it solo piano, or were you with a band? It was everything, and of course you had more than binders, yeah. You had uh, what we call fake books at the time, and they had uh, the, the melody and the chords and the lyrics in big binders so that if you were playing requests, 
if you were in the kind of situation that took requests, then you would you would have to be able to fulfill those requests, and you couldn't memorize everything, but you certainly could look it up and and, and give a version of it. But a lot of times the bands were pre-practiced and you did a 20 minute set and you only did the stuff that you prepared. And uh, it just depends if you were playing a casual, which would be a a wedding or or a party of some kind, or if you're in a saloon, if it was a show bar and you had to sing and you had to tell jokes, it just depends where you were working. Did you write your own arrangements as well in the nightclubs? Oh, you bet, yeah, sure. And for singers that needed to have, the singers that went from place to place, the the nightclub was, uh, it's been going quite a while now, but it, it provided uh, uh, work for a lot of people. And, uh, for example, I went to high school in Miami, so Miami Beach in the 50s had uh, a lot of night clubs and singers and dancers and shows that they put on and they weren't big spectacular shows necessarily but every hotel had a showroom and a comedian and maybe a dancer or two Um, so the work was varied now um you went to louisiana state university which you recently have donated your original scores to let's talk about your undergraduate training there and you majored in is it piano and composition hey yes i went there on a uh, on a bassoon scholarship but i majored in piano and composition so i was busy all the time and of course i worked at night uh forever and um i i enjoyed uh every part of it i was i graduated high school i was 17 years old it was 1959 and went to two, four years at Louisiana. So nights was playing in a club. Days were uh, in school, like other people. And because you were a scholarship student, you were required to play in every event that uh, needed music. Tell me about that training. Up to that point, you had played a lot of music up to your entry into college. What was that experience like? Was it challenging? Was there new information? It was challenging in in the sense that when you got seated in the middle of the orchestra and then your ears opened up. In other words, in high school, uh, you were studying, you were studying uh, theory with your father and your grandfather and you were playing jazz and, and you uh, playing, practicing your your classics but in, then in college you had the formal you actually had classes in counterpoint and theory and uh, I, I certainly was uh, at the level or a little bit ahead when I got to college because I wasn't finding myself I, I was a musician from the beginning and uh, the opening up of the ears by being in the middle of the orchestra was the most revealing. I started hearing what the great composers were doing and became much more curious. And then at the end of four years, it was not enough. You had to continue. And you went to Juilliard. And then I went to Juilliard for another four years. Can I, and, look, uh, let me ask you about that. There's so many interesting things about that that you mentioned. So, for instance... You mentioned in an interview that there were different types of teachers. For instance, there was one who made you listen to every single note you wrote, and you had to justify every single note. This is correct. Uh, Hugo Weisskopf was, was an opera composer and one on the staff at the, uh, um, at the Juilliard School, and he was very picky about you justifying every note that you put down. Now, he, it was like good cop, bad cop, in the sense that there was a Vittorio Giannini, who was another composer. We had a class, and he would give you impossible assignments for the next week. He would say, now next week, I want a choral prelude based on this theme. I want the second movement of a string quartet 
in the key of E flat, and he would give you impossible amounts of work to do. And then we would hurt ourselves doing that. And then he, I remember him saying he had a big, uh, he had a big trash can next to his desk, and he'd say, "Mr. Conti, would you bring your work up here?" And he'd flip through it, and then he'd toss it in the trash. Then you go back and sit down. And for next week, I want a sonata. What well, is that? Key. Because he didn't like the music, or it just wasn't enough for no, him? No, he says you haven't even begun to write music. You must write more music. And of course, the other guy was saying you couldn't get past the first eight bars because he would say, "And why did you do this? And why did you do that?" Anyway, the no, in, this is very. The, I love this. This is wonderful. And so, for instance, the 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 teacher who was asking you to justify every note was he was he very strict with his counterpoint, and is that the reason he he wanted to make sure everything was in place? He wanted you to think. He 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 actually wanted you to not just feel, he wanted you to think. Vincent Persichetti was there, and he would say, next week I want you to bring me all fourth movements that you can find that begin at, at an upbeat in the key of A. So your assignment would send you to the library to look for the fourth movement. Now, right away, it has to be some kind of a symphonic thing or, or a suite to get you to the fourth movement. It has to be in A major and it ha- or F sharp minor, and it has to begin on an upbeat. And his point was, you had to look through so much music that you you became curious about 14 pieces of music before you found that one piece in A that had an upbeat. And he would do this every week. He'd look for third movements in E flat minor. Now, that's not a key that a lot of people wrote in. But but he but you would also have to find things of interest while you were in the library. So they had different techniques at the higher level of education, rather than just passing a uh, a theory test. Can I ask you one question? You're a great pianist. Here's just a tip for my audience. How do you get better at sight reading? And that also includes this ability to look at a s- orchestral score and reduce it down to the piano. Well, it, 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 sometimes it takes two. In, in other words, you're looking at a piece of music. Let's say you're looking at one line of music. So you look at the first four bars And if you can't look at the first four bars and memorize that, then you look at the first two bars. And maybe you can only look at a bar. You're looking at the first bar of music and you memorize it. Now, they might only have four notes in it. But while you're playing that first bar, you're looking at the second bar and trying to memorize it. So that you can have a friend, say, cover the first two bars while you play, now you're looking at the second two bars. If you get what I'm saying is that how you begin to sight read is is you, you look at the first bar and you say, I got it. But while you're playing that, you're looking at the second bar. And maybe you can get to the eighth bar while you're playing the first eighth bars. You're looking at the second eight bars. So you, that takes what? Practice. Now you can learn how to sight read. You want to look at a, a, a score that has, oh, let's say 22 staves. Now staves are, are, are clefs of, and clefs of music. Let's say 22 staves and the woodwinds, the brass and the, and the strings and the percussion. Well, somebody's playing in in tonal music. Somebody's playing a melody. Who's playing the melody? Where is it? Well, you you look for it. If it's not a melody, it's a rhythm. Where's the rhythm going? Where is the the action going? And your eyes have to, to hone in on that and then play. And in the very beginning, you might just be haltingly playing one bar at a time very slowly. But in the end, you'll take a 22-page score of music 
and you'll play it the best that you can. You can't play every note, but you will get the gist of the music. Vincent Persichetti was also a teacher of yours. He would get non-pianists to create music at the piano. And you mentioned him as an example of someone who's very free. But he also wrote a book on 20th century harmony that was quite influential. How did he teach that freedom while also making sure that the music had some cohesion to it? Well, he used, he used uh, contemporary music in his, in his textbook, which he used in his class, of course. So instead of using a, uh, a textbook from a different era, his examples were more timely if you were studying contemporary music, uh, like an orchestration book of Rimsky-Korsakov that uses his examples, uh, or, or the, the Walter Piston book that uses uh, more contemporary uh, examples of orchestration. So he was, Vincent uh, uh, Persichetti was an encyclopedic brain, and uh, he had a command of, of the repertoire. He knew the repertoire, and, and he was freely trying to pull together all the periods of music along with the uh, contemporary music. Uh, not, not so much the avant-garde, so, but Vincent Persichetti would be, we, you'd be studying the, the people of the 20th century that were uh, using musical techniques that were valid, including uh, uh, 12-tone techniques, which is a horrible system, but it's a system. So he was in, in all in. Why, why do you say it's he a horrible was, system? Very really quickly. Well, it's a, it's a system. It's a system. The tonality is a system, but it has derived from thousands of years of working in the music, uh, w- working with sound, a- as a uh, as a rebellion against that, uh, and and some kind of. Uh, well, rebellion is a good word. Uh, it, l- when you create a system that is based on nothing but mathematics, it's not based on what music is based on, then it's a hard, it, it's, it's the same reason why nobody wants to hear it. In other words, I think the proof of the pudding is, is so much... Uh, aside from the fact that the, the concert hall is a museum, I mean, we understand that. It's a museum. It's a place you go to to hear the great works, but but you, you certainly don't go to hear uh, John Cage. And I guess final question is, and that's a great segue because um, you write powerful, emotional, dramatic music that really touches people. There are a lot of music students who go to college and they're trying to learn music. They're learning harmony theories. There's a lot of theories. Sometimes I think there's also a bit of a, in music colleges, people almost kind of put down tonal music in a way that it's, it's, they think, oh, if you're not writing atonal music or serialist music, it's not serious music. How do we make sense of, of making sure that we at least have the craft to write music that we want to, that can communicate with people and is able to express yourself in a way that is listenable and interesting? And this is for music students. That, but that, but that, you just said it. In other words, the... Um it's like the art world. If it's industrial and you don't think about it, and if everything is called art, then there is no art. There is nothing. Uh, the human uh, doesn't react to it in, in or uplift. Uh, the James Joyce uh, in, in Portrait of an Artist talks about the ultimate uh, um, aesthetic experience, of course, is awe. A W E. There's no words. It's not kinetic. And by the way, it's not emotional either. In other words, that my, what I do in music, music at the basis level, at the very absolute lowest level, appeals to your emotion. Now, that's very special because it is the ultimate fantasy. It enters your brain. You, you. It's not literal. And there you are crying or laughing or being excited or scared and and it's music and it has that power that's not the ultimate aesthetic experience the uh, which is if if you're moved by the grand canyon because there are no words to describe it you stand in front of it and you're 
simply lost for words. Now, in music, if you are lost for emotion and words, which is (laughs) the total disintegration of any kind of communication, you stand before something that gives you absolutely nothing, uh, then it's not what art has been from the the, the 45,000 years when the guys painted the 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 very expressive animals on the caves they they were expressions of human of human transcendental not just thoughts and emotions but the idea of being in touch with the transcendental the idea of this something more than you now what what i don't know what that more that is but it certainly in the history of music and and all of art has been attempted to try to bring you to that other place. Now, if that other place doesn't exist, it should exist at least in theory. If no one wants to take you any place but for a discussion, in other words, it's discursive. Oh, look at this painting, it's interesting. Let's talk about what it is. And you say, oh, it's red here, and it's orange here, and it's green. It makes me think of, then it's like a raw shot tank. Oh, it makes me think of uh, flies. This is not at all what anything has meant since the beginning of man expressing himself. Discursive. And I get it. It's not literal anymore, and it's not about feelings. It's just about talking about it. So the people that want to study and and produce stuff that's talked about is not the business that, that, that it's been forever. So the student who, who, who now what he's asked for in the, in the, uh, uh, the music school in the art school is, uh, because the two things that are only important are being interesting and being well done. Okay. If, and, and it seems like Picasso has made it bad for everybody. If you're not interesting, then we don't care. So the, the only thing we want to hear is that, are you interesting? Well, that's not enough. It's just not enough to, to, to paint a, a tomato soup can. That has no meaning. That's like a bad, that's like a joke. So, in some context, the young person who was going to, I remember once being forced to listen to, uh, 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 what's his name? Anyway, we started 15 metronomes all at once. Oh, is that a legacy? No, it was Stockhausen. No, oh, Stockhausen. Stockhausen, okay. came, Stockhausen came to Juilliard, and it was like everyone was outbidding the other guy to be more outrageous. So we could talk about them, but it was not, it's not music. It's not, has no meaning. It has discursive meaning. You can talk about it. So you, if you want a job in academia, then then you can probably do that. You probably can do that. But if you want people to respond to your music in in a traditional way, then you have to look backwards not forwards is music is music for people well there's there's no there's two there's two kinds uh, uh not Ligeti, the other one uh, but Br- B- benjamin britton had that discussion and let's say the the Ligeti is writing for 2000 people in the world and britton wants to write for everyone else so that in one you're in one camp or you're in the other camp you want to write for 2000 people in the world the the painted word that's Tom Wolfe. It's a little book. It's a great book. And um, he talks about the 500 people in the world that control the art industry. And if they say you, you, there's a no go, it's a no go. Tom Wolfe, the painted word. And, and it's true, they control. And the same way with music schools. If you go in and, and if you just write something that you, you like, 
uh, and it's tonal, they don't want it. They don't care about it. But if you write something outrageous, then maybe you have a shot. <laughs> well, I must say it's been a great honor to speak with the master composer, Bill Conti. Thank you. Ah, thank you. Thank you so much for spending some time with me to talk about music. I wish you great health, continued success in 2021. Thank you, and I hope to talk to you again soon. Bye-bye now. Thank you. Bye-bye.